Good morning. I just want to take a minute to go through some of the slides that are on this Protestant Reformation PowerPoint. And the first slide is about the causes of Reformation. And um, there's a lot more reasons than this, but this is just simplified for you. Uh, first one is the Black Death, with over 50% of the population dying in some parts of Europe. It left the church very weak, especially when those who are dying seek refuge from the church. So the clergymen are going to be the ones who die in greater numbers than just about any other population. Uh, we have questions about church versus state. The same questions that we had during the Renaissance and during the Middle Ages, uh, it's still going on. Who has power? Is it the leaders of the church or is it the political leaders, the physical kings? Uh, speaking of kings, in the year 1305, the French king is going to have the Pope kidnapped and sent back to France. So there becomes this question of who actually has the, the power of the Pope. Is it the series of popes that are forced to live in France, or is it the popes who have been appointed in Rome? And this doesn't actually get solved until an event in 1417 known as the Council of Constance where three different people claiming to be Pope are going to be asked to come to a meeting. And all three of them are going to be fired, basically, and a brand new Pope is going to be elected. We have some people who are going to start speaking out against the church. And the first of these is John Wycliffe from England. And John Wycliffe, he's going to say uh, that the church isn't supposed to own property. The church isn't supposed to have pilgrimages. He's going to say the Christian Bible doesn't say anything about saints or the cult of Mary. And he basically wants to get back down to basics. He translates the Bible into English to prove his point. And before you know it, people start to follow him. And they use his ideas to stage a revolt. And by the year 1400, John Wycliffe, who meant well, his ideas become capital crimes. It is now illegal to become a follower of John Wycliffe or to you know, believe in his thoughts. Moving on from that, we got a guy named Jan Hus, who is from Bohemia. Bohemia is in Central Europe. Jan Hus lived in England at the time. He becomes a follower of John Wycliffe, and when his life is endangered, he goes back to Bohemia where he brings the ideas of John Wycliffe. In Bohemia, the ideas of Huss and Wycliffe lead to the overthrow of Catholic leaders, the break from the Catholic Church, and Jan Huss is going to be invited to the Council of Constance meeting, and he's going to be tried and executed there for being a heretic. Now, what were the biggest complaints? I've got them listed here. Uh, first one is immorality. A Catholic priest then, a Catholic priest now, not supposed to live with women, not supposed to have children, supposed to be celibate and chaste. It wasn't happening. There were children of, of Catholic priests running around everywhere. There were a couple of popes who had children, and ironically, those popes' children became popes. Uh, priests were drinking and gambling, and instead of doing anything about it, the church just looked the other way. Clerical ignorance. Uh, so many people died in the Black Death that the people who were rehired to fill the clergy, they didn't know what was going on. They were faking it till they made it. And when the Christian Bible began to be translated into the common languages of the day, people started to realize that the Catholic Church was not as strong or powerful or as well put together as people thought. Clerical pluralism. A priest would be hired to hold multiple churches, and they would never go to both of them. They would just basically be paying two paychecks and only go into one place, if that. And then finally, indulgences. There were door-to-door -door salesmen going around selling forgiveness. So you didn't actually have to be sorry. You didn't have to actually you know, ask for forgiveness. You just you bought a card, and that was enough to uh, supposedly save your soul. So... Behind all of this, you got a guy named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, um, he was, by all counts and purposes, a good Catholic. Um, he became a monk. He did his Hail Marys. He gave confession. He did everything he was supposed to do. But no matter what, um, 
he feels like he's done something wrong. Um, he's initially taught that repentance doesn't involve anything self-afflicted or self-inflicted. It's all about following the Catholic code, the Catholic creed, if you will. But he eventually comes up with this idea that salvation had nothing to do with external forces. It was all internal forces. Basically, uh, if you had personal faith, personal salvation, then you would be saved. And he went on further to say that this personal salvation is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. And he comes up with this phrase called justification by faith alone. That was different from the Catholic Church at the time because you had to have faith and you had to perform works as well. There were certain steps, uh, certain loopholes, or hula hoops, whatever you want to call it, that you had to go through in the Catholic Church to gain salvation. October 31st, 1517, yes, that was Halloween, 1517, uh, he posts a list of 95 issues he has against the church and against the Pope on the door of Wittenberg Castle. And he is going to criticize the Pope. He's going to criticize the church. He's going to say the Pope's just worried about money. And as a thank you for his efforts, he's going to be declared a heretic by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is going to refute everything that Luther believes in. Uh, Luther says the Bible is the sole source of authority. Luther says there are only two sacraments in the Bible, the sacrament of communion, the sacrament of baptism. And then Luther says nowhere in the Christian Bible does it say anything about purgatory or the cult of Mary. And nowhere does it say that the bread and the wine that you ingest during communion actually turns into blood or actually turns into flesh, which was a belief of the Catholic Church. I'm going to skip this video. And what were the political impacts of Luther? A lot of people living in Germany, which is where Luther was from, thought this would unite Germany. Germany didn't actually become a country until the 1870s. Before that, it was a lot of individual kingdoms. Well, when the peasants revolt in 1524, over 100,000 peasants die. It actually splits up Germany even more than before. The Peace of Augsburg, 1555, meant that every German prince could choose what you would become, whether you'd be a Lutheran or a Catholic. So each German prince, they decide, I want to be a Catholic, and then all of his subjects are going to be Catholic and uh, vice versa. So. In reality, the German princes get even more powerful because not only do they have political power over you, they have religious power over you now, too. John Calvin's in here as well. Uh, John Calvin, he comes up with this idea of predestination. And today, Calvinism is found around the world. Here in the United States, we know it better as Presbyterianism. And according to John Calvin and his theory of predestination, you're either saved or not before you're born. Everybody inherits original sin, and uh, the Christian God has chosen before your birth whether you will be allowed to have eternal life or not. But we have the English Reformation, and this is really just about sex. Um, the War of the Roses, which was an English Civil War, it has just gotten over. King Henry VIII is worried about having a son because if he doesn't have a son, he's afraid that his family might be replaced just like the family before his. And in this quest to have a kid, Henry VIII is going to get divorced a few times. He's going to get married a few times. He will have a couple of kids. And here's a list of his wives. Catherine of Aragon, she lives. She produces a child named Mary. Anne Boleyn is put to death. Jane Seymour, she dies after childbirth. She gives birth to a son. Anne of Cleves, Henry never met her and didn't like her when he does meet her. Uh, Catherine Howard actually slept with uh, somebody other than the king, so her adultery was confirmed. And then Catherine Parr is going to outlive Henry 
and by that time Henry VIII is so old that he can't have children. All total, Henry VIII does have three children, Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. Only Edward is the son, and he dies young before he is at the age of 18. This is a good video. It's called The Wives of Henry VIII, Divorced, Beheaded, and Died Song. It's just something fun if you wanted to watch it. Um, you can find it on YouTube. All right, so Henry VIII, uh, just to kind of simplify the story that you see here, when Henry VIII realizes that Catherine of Aragon and he will not have a boy, he asks the Pope permission to divorce. The Pope is a relative of Catherine and says absolutely not. So at that point in time, Henry is going to leave the Catholic Church, name himself the head of his brand new Anglican Church, and will give away all of the Catholic Church lands. Now to get Parliament to go along with this, Henry gives up some of his power, which is the beginning of the end of absolute rule in England. This is going to become more and more of a constitutional monarchy like we have today. Now by and large, everything that Henry's new Anglican Church is doing, it's still Catholic. It's just he's going to lead the church instead of the Pope. We do still have this church today. In England, it's known as the Church of England. Here in the United States, it's known as the Episcopalian Church. What happens after Henry VIII? Well, Queen Mary I, who was the daughter of Catherine. Queen Mary I was raised Catholic, and she tries to bring Catholicism back to the, to the country. And when she becomes queen, she murders a bunch of people. She becomes known as Bloody Mary. And then she marries a Catholic, which freaks everybody out. They think that they're all going to become Catholic again. Elizabeth I, she's going to take over after Mary is basically overthrown. And she tries to find a way that she can make everybody happy. How can I make the Protestants happy? How can I make the Catholics happy? And she does this by creating something known as the Articles of Faith. Uh, what she requires everybody to do is attend, attend a Church of England service. But what you do on your own time, that she doesn't care. She just mainly wants loyalty, and she wants people to keep this image of loyalty. Last but not least, we have the Catholic Reformation. And um, it's also known as the Counter-Reformation. There is a Crash Course video out on this. And really, what you should know here is the Catholic Church determines that they're right and everybody else is wrong. Uh, they say we're doing things right. They say that justification by works and faith is the correct way to go. They say that the Pope has just as much authority as the Bible does. And the Catholic Church is going to say you still have to do pilgrimage. You still have to uh, go through saints and the cult of Mary. And transubstantiation, the idea that the water turns into wine when you drink it, that's confirmed too. Uh, however... The Catholic Church says there are a couple of things we can do better on. Uh, new religious orders are going to be created because of this. Uh, you got the Carmelite nuns who say we need to do better with the poor, those living in poverty. So the Carmelite nuns are going to live pop impoverished lives to try and reach those living in that condition and convince them to become and stay Catholic. The Ursuline nuns are going to focus on education, and they're going to educate wives and mothers so that way that they can raise their children to be good, strong Catholics and basically rebuild Catholicism from the ground up. The most important of these religious orders, though, is the Society of Jesus. And every time I talk about them, I refer to them as stormtroopers. Hopefully you have seen Star Wars. Um, wherever the Pope needs somebody to go to convert people, he sends the Society of Jesus. And so the Jesuits are going to become confessors to kings. The Jesuits are going to go around the, around the world, not the country, but around the world with explorers. And before you know it, Jesuits are going to be in South America. They're going to be in North America. They're going to be in Asia and Africa. And they're going to turn hundreds of thousands of people into Catholics. And then, finally, the Council of Trent. It's a 
18 year long series of meetings where the Catholic Church is going to decide how to respond to the English Reformation and how to respond to the Protestant Reformation. And this is where they decide we're the ones that are right. We're not going to change anything. We're going to keep going the way we're going. All right, there's a lot more detail I could go into, but I know you have just a short attention span. So 15 minutes is enough. If you have any questions or if you want to know any more details, just send me an email and I'd be glad to help you out. And I uh, hope you have a good day. Talk to you soon.